Douglas from Beverly Hills, California, and thank you for joining us for another Thyroid Thursday. And today I have the esteemed uh, Dr. Babak Larian uh, from Beverly Hills and also in Cedar sinai Hospital uh, and also private practice here in Los Angeles. And he is an expert in thyroid function and thyroid disease. And I think for our audience with Graves' disease or Hashimoto's, you'll really enjoy some of what he's going to explain and tell us today. And thank you so much, Babak, for joining for Thanks, thanks so much, Douglas. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to be here. So let me first just kind of describe the thyroid and where it is. Let me bring this in. So when you, when you look at the neck, the thyroid gland, basically positioned in the lower part of the neck. So this is the thyroid gland. Right. It has two lobes, the right side here, the left side, and this is called the pyramidal lobe. The pyramidal lobe is an extension of the thyroid. The thyroid is developed in the back of the tongue in the fetus, and as it travels down into the neck, as it travels down, it leaves a little lip of tissue bag on its path. Uh, the function of the thyroid gland, obviously, is to control the metabolism of the body. So the brain and the thyroid gland function together to control that. So let me show you. I love the animation. Yeah, it works really <laughs> well. So there's a gland in the brain that sends a hormone down to the thyroid gland called TSH. And is this the same TSH that our patients get measured in their blood? It's the exact same thing. The TSH goes to the thyroid gland and instructs the gland to produce the thyroid hormones. Right? And in response to it, the thyroid produces T4 and releases it into the bloodstream. The T4 circulates in the blood and some of that gets into the brain and the brain, this gland in the brain, measures the concentration of TSH and the availability of T4 in the blood. And based on that, decides to adjust the production of TSH and therefore the functioning of the thyroid gland. So these two work together in concert to control the amount of hormone that's present in our bloodstream. Um, when patients have hormonal issues, we can figure that out by looking at the level of TSH and the hormones in the bloodstream. Yeah. Okay. So the thyroid uh, is, is very interesting gland because it is located in the in the lower neck, right? It sits on top of the breathing tube. This is the breathing tube. And it sits underneath the voice box, right there, right? And behind it, when you turn the thyroid around, when you flip the thyroid around, there are four little glands called the parathyroid glands. And these four glands control the level of calcium in your bloodstream. So their job is very particular only manage calcium levels. And it's a very important function because the concentration of calcium in the blood is really important on how the body functions. And so uh, it's a, a huge concern when you do surgery to maintain and preserve these parathyroids. In addition to that, the nerves of the voice box come out of the brain, go into the chest, do a turn, and come right behind the thyroid before they get into the voice box. So on each side, they can do that. And so when you're doing thyroid surgery, you have to find these nerves first, protect them, find the parathyroid, protect them, maintain the blood vessels that are feeding them, and then proceed with surgery. Yeah. And that's why you obviously need an expert like you doing this type of surgery, right. because it's a very complicated anatomy. It's very delicate. You know, there's a small anatomy space that you're working in, and you have a lot of important structures in that very small space. So. The more experience you have, the better you're going to do with the surgery. The more changes and variations and anatomical abnormalities that you've seen and you have under your belt, so it becomes uh, an easier process to deal with all the differences that can be present. So many of our patients with Graves' disease have hyperthyroidism. So as, as you know and our patients know, that's too much hormone. So just as accordingly, it's often suppressing their TSH. Right. And so, you know, when our patients have these levels measured, that's often what they're, they're measuring. Now, in Graves' disease in particular, it's an autoimmune process where antibodies attack the thyroid gland and other glands, and they can actually abnormally stimulate 
the production of hormone. So I was hoping what you could do in telling us a little bit as to why do some patients need to have that gland removed mm -hmm. because of this constant autoimmune attack and grave disease, and, and how might that be beneficial for some patients? Okay. So, you know, again, normally the gland in the brain is producing TSH, which goes to the thyroid gland to stimulate it. So it's called a thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, right? The antibodies in grave are towards the receptor in the thyroid gland that the TSH attaches to to perform its function. So the antibodies, which we'll draw in red, directly, uh, the antibodies, directly go to the thyroid gland, attach to that receptor for TSH, and act like TSH itself, stimulating the gland to produce extra hormone, right? At the same time, they cause an inflammatory process in the thyroid gland because they're antibodies and they affect the immune system. So the gland itself gets inflamed and can potentially get even larger. And in doing so, you have extra thyroid hormone that's being released. Uh, and this level of thyroid hormone that's being released into the bloodstream is not modulated. It's not controlled by the brain anymore. It's, it's being controlled by these antibodies. So the levels continue to go up, which causes all the hyperthyroid symptoms of the patients with grades now. So when that state exists, when the hyperthyroid state exists, then there's a few options to take to address it, all of which are trying to decrease the production of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. And one of, some are medications, right, the antithyroid medications. There's radioactive iodine, and there's obviously thyroid surgery. So in terms of thyroid surgery, what you're doing is you're removing this entire gland. And just to recap for people, the antibodies are typically called the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins because they're stimulating thyroid hormone production. And so the surgery is taking away that target for those antibodies yeah. so they no longer can overproduce hormone, but you do then have to supplement that hormone later on if you would remove the thyroid gland. Correct. Yeah, the thyroid hormone performs a very important function. It affects the metabolism of all the cells in your body. So how they function at the level of function that they have, okay? And so it is an important hormone which we can't live without. Yeah. Right? So when you remove the thyroid gland because it's overstimulated by these antibodies and it's causing havoc in the body, yeah, when you remove the gland, you have to replace it with thyroid hormones. And that form comes in the form of a pill you can take every day and sometimes supplements. And there are natural ways that this, this hormone can be replaced as well through natural, uh, natural products. Um, but the surgery is very intricate, especially in a gland that's inflamed yeah. from the antibodies causing an immune reaction. And they may not be able to see all the little blood vessels, but there's all these little blood vessels over the thyroid gland that get huge, right. especially any patient who knows that they're, they can feel their thyroid gland. These glands get very large and very inflamed with all these blood vessels. Right. And there's lots of blood vessels on the surface of the thyroid, and they get engorged and get bigger. So much so that sometimes patients feel pulsations on their neck, over the gland. And if you touch the neck of the patients who've had enlarged glands, you can sometimes actually feel the pulses going through these blood vessels because the glands have such enlarged uh, blood vessels. And oftentimes when patients have huge vascularity of the thyroid, you have to give them iodine preoperative to suppress that reaction and decrease the blood flow to it so that the surgery has less bleeding during it. And usually you can manage the, uh, the blood flow very well so that the bleeding can be minimized in yeah. training surgery. Um, but it is, it is surgery that's done routinely. The majority of the surgeries for the thyroid gland are being done for cancers, thyroid cancers and thyroid nodules. But it's the same type of surgery that you would do for someone who has Graves' disease. The extent of it is the same. You know, you're doing the same thing. So a lot of the experience that the surgeons have in removing comes from their experience in the thyroid cancers, which, when the cancers are small, can be easier than a, than a Graves' disease thyroid that you're addressing, and sometimes the cancers are significantly bigger and more complicated. So a great range of experience comes with doing thyroid surgery. Yeah. And how is, where is the scar and how big is the scar? I think yeah, that's a question. question that a lot of patients ask. Right, and it's a very important question. The, the incision is usually in the lower neck, because that ends up being right in the middle of the thyroid gland, in a sense, right? And the incision generally has to do with the size of the thyroid gland. The 
tissue map. So the larger the gland, the larger the incision, because you have, you have to work around the gland and be able to remove the gland and bring it out. Now, the size of the incision is dictated only by half, because you can remove half of the gland at a time and take it out of that incision. So you don't need an incision that encompasses both sides. And the skin of the neck is so versatile that you can move it from side to side. So you can minimize the incision. Generally, the incisions that I use are roughly about an inch, an inch and a quarter. That's the size that I start with. You know? so very small. Yeah, very small incision. And usually very successful. I'd say probably 80 to 90% of the time that incision is more than adequate to take care of the problem. The skin in the neck and the face are different than the skin of the body. They're evolutionally designed differently in the sense that the body skin is designed for when you have a trauma to heal quickly so you can have a big thick scar that quickly heals so that the person can get up and be active. The quality of the skin of the face and the neck is very different. The skin is thinner, has a lot more blood vessels in it, so it heals better and faster with less scarring. So fortunately, because of that, patients tend to heal very well from these smaller incisions in the neck, actually. And, you know, I know that you do a lot of these surgeries routinely, and I know you're very modest at, of, of just how good you are. But if patients, um, obviously, I would first recommend that they come to you in Los Angeles, but if they're going to have a consult with a thyroid surgeon, how many should a thyroid surgeon do or to feel comfortable that this is a routine part of their practice? Very good question. There's actually research out there looking at this very subject. And the number is 50. If a surgeon is doing 50 cases a year, then the risk of complications dramatically is dramatically less as compared to someone who does less than 50. So that's the magic number, and that's the question to be asked. You know? If you're going to a thyroid surgeon locally, you have to ask them how many cases they do a year. You know, and if they are doing 70, 80 cases, then you're in good hands. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll do some Real more pleasure. segments in the future for patients to look forward to. But I think very beneficial in covering all aspects of this, of this surgery and parts of the disease. So I'm glad to be here.